Great, now I'm going to have two videos. I wonder what to do about that. OK, so um, she finally admits to herself and her father that she got pregnant uh, deliberately, perhaps as a way to escape her childhood. So, uh, and then finally, at the last paragraph of this section, um, it says they talked late into the night. I'm on page 248. They talked late into the night as if they were old friends. And Stoner came to realize that she was, as she had said, almost happy with her despair. Shows So she's in despair, but she's almost happy about it. She would live her days out quietly, drinking a little more day by uh, year by year, numbing herself against the nothingness her life had become. He was glad she had that at least. He was grateful that she could drink. So um, what kind of a person has Grace become? She's not exactly happy, but she's, um, let, we can say she's resigned to her life. Like she kind of accepts that this is what her life is. Um, she doesn't have uh, too much hope for the future. That's what despair means, right? A lot, lack of hope. Um, and we can tell that this is probably because of her childhood and the way that she escaped her childhood. Um, we rarely get a sense of uh, her getting to do what she wants or in developing any of her own interests. It's always uh, either escaping Edith and resting with Stoner or uh, being controlled by Edith, doing what Edith wants her to do. Uh, the friends that she makes in high school seem to be because her mother wants her to make friends. Right. And uh, it says here that at the top of 248, line five, sorry, line three, I knew enough not to get pregnant unless I wanted to, Lord knows. All those boys in high school. So it seems like before she was allowed to start drinking, she was already uh, in a state of despair, of hopelessness, and it was using physical pleasure as her escape. Um, but now that she can drink, she's using alcohol as her escape. You know, in order to, to really find something that interests you or to be grabbed by some kind of passion, uh, it requires, first of all, for there to be a you. You have to be uh, a functioning person. You have to have a, a basis of, of uh, self-identity. And Grace doesn't have this. Uh, and it, we can also compare this uh, to Edith. Remember, we discussed and concluded that Edith also got married in order to escape her childhood. But look at how her marriage ended up. She's so focused on trying to do the, the things that a good wife should do um, that it, she had to actively figure out what she liked to do after her father died. She had to spend a lot of time experimenting to see what she wanted out of life. Um, and it seems like, at least from the perspective of Stoner, it seems like what she wanted out of life is to torture him, to, tr to basically like treat him as poorly as possible. Um, she used to have some friends, and then she didn't have many friends, and now we don't really know what she does during the day. Um, so that same kind of childhood back background tells us what kind of life Grace is probably going to have as an adult. Um, so I think the best way to describe Grace as an adult is uh, despairing, lack of hope, lack of meaning in life. Uh, and so Stoner thinks to himself, at least she could drink. At least that's something. That's not nothing. It's almost nothing, but it's not nothing. It can help her get by. It can help her through the nothingness her life had become. Okay, let's look at the next question. And uh, 
now I'm not sharing my screen, so. Uh, you know what? Maybe I should jump back to my computer. Teacher, that way you can. Yeah. Can I share my screen to everyone? Sure, sure, sure. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. That's a good idea. Um, great. OK, so question two. Stoner thinks that he has given passion and love to every moment of his life and perhaps had given it most fully when he was unaware of his giving. Do you agree? Why or why not? And if you do agree, what would it look like for someone not to live like this? So first of all, uh, let's let's talk about what this means. To give passion and love to every moment of his life. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. Like he lives, he thinks that he had lived his life with passion and love at every moment. But what about the second half? He had perhaps given them most fully when he was unaware of his giving. So the idea here seems to be that um, to give passion and love to your life, to every moment of your life, it is not something that you have to actively do. Like you don't wake up one day and say, I will be passionate and full of love today. Um, it seems like it's something that comes along with doing other things. So here he says, when he was unaware of his giving, only when he was busy doing other things was his passion and love able to be uh, expressed and and to uh, let his life be imbued by them, to be instilled with passion and love. Um, so let's let's look at uh, page two fifty. Uh, let's see where is this. OK, so uh, let's start from. Line one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Line eight. It occurred to him, uh, by the way, this is a uh, stoner's really long death scene. So he's now lying on his deathbed. Um, OK, so it occurred to him that he was nearly 60 years old and that he ought to be beyond the force of such passion, of such love. But he was not beyond it, he knew, and would never be. Beneath the numbness, the indifference, the removal, in other words, stepping outside of his own life, removing himself from his own life. It was there, intense and steady. It had always been there. So it's when we talk about passion and love, we often talk about the intense part, but it's also for stoner steady. It's always there. In his youth, he had given it freely without thought. He had given it to the knowledge which had been revealed to him. How many years ago by Archer Sloan? So this is talking about his passion and love for literature. He had given it to Edith in those first blind, foolish days of his courtship and marriage. Uh, courtship, of course, means pursuing, pursuit, soichol. And he had given it to Catherine, Catherine Driscoll, as if it had never been given before. So in other words, like his passion and love for Catherine is something completely new to him, or it felt like something completely new to him. He had, in odd ways, given it to every moment of his life and had perhaps given it most fully when he was unaware of his giving. It was a passion neither of the mind nor of the flesh, which means body, so not like a sexual or emotional passion. Rather, it was a force that comprehended them both. Comprehend here means include. So the passion that he's talking about includes both passion of the mind and passion of the body. Uh, OK, continuing. As if they were but the matter of love, its specific substance. 
So he's saying that this passion is simply the substance of love. So when we talk about love, it's a very abstract idea. What does it actually mean? To Stoner, he thinks in his life, love for him is the passion that he had for everything. Continuing. To a woman or to a poem, it said simply, look, I am alive. So that's the kind of uh, passion and love that he's talking about. A passion and love for every moment of everything in his life. So the first question here is, do you agree? Why or why not? Um, I don't know about you, but personally, I think that I actually don't agree. It's true that when we are reading the story of Stoner's life, he is always very focused on whatever he's doing. He always cares about what he's doing, uh, even when it seems like he doesn't care, right? When in his older years, he seems indifferent to people, but he still cares about his job and about his students. But I don't quite agree that every moment is full of passion and love because, um, or I should say, it only feels like this by design of the novel. In other words, if we think about the story and the world of the story, there must have been moments and times and even periods of time in which Stoner was not entirely present, was not full a giving of passion and love. There must have been times when he was just getting by or just going about his day. But we don't see those times, and that is because of the design of the novel. We only see the parts of his life that he really does care about. Um, and that's partly the, the source of the power of this novel, is that it's only filled with moments of passion and love. Uh, but for Stoner as a person, in his own world, the world of the story, uh, I don't think that every moment of his life is full of this passion, love, engagement, attention, intensity, that kind of thing. Um, the second part of this question, what would it look like for someone not to live like this? So uh, if we take the events of the novel that we see um, and we think about what they might look like without what Stoner thinks of as his passion and love for everything that he does. Um, one answer could be that it just wouldn't appear in the novel. Uh, it wouldn't be important enough uh, for the main character to be mentioned in the novel. Um, another possibility might be that uh, we might have a, one of those brief summaries that the novel has. Like at the very beginning of the novel, you remember, we had a very brief summary of Stoner's life. Or uh, just now, at the end of chapter 15, we had a brief summary of Grace, uh, Grace's teenage and early adult years. So. Uh, these seem to be periods of time in which um, the characters don't seem to be fully uh, passionate about, we can even say large periods of their life. Uh, and yet, because it is still part of life, the novel does have to mention them. But it does so quickly because there is no particular moment or set of moments that is really worth spending time on or giving attention to. Uh, OK, next question. Why do you think Stoner is grateful that Lomax refuses to speak to him to the very end? So on page 266. Uh, so remember, because of the Charles Walker thing, Stoner and Lomax are no longer speaking. Um, even when Stoner was fighting to get his old courses back, he only spoke through uh, Gordon Finch uh, and through secretaries, but never spoke to Lomax directly. 
Um, and this scene is at Stoner's retirement party. The university throws a party, a dinner party for him on the eve of his retirement. Uh, and after he gives that short speech, everybody that like, comes around, uh, shakes his hand, wishes him well. Uh, but on page 266, uh, four lines from the bottom of this sec section. Lomax. Lomax was in one of the groups, but he did not turn as Stoner passed. And Stoner found that he was grateful that they had not had to speak to each other after all of this time. So why is he grateful? Notice how it, the sentence is written. Uh, that Stoner found that he was grateful that they had not had to speak to each other after all this time. So first of all, he's grateful that they were not forced to speak to each other. Uh, what would force them? The, the circumstance of like being polite at Stoner's retirement party? Um, or uh, as an acknowledgement of why there is a retirement party, uh, because Lomax is still trying to get rid of him, so he found any excuse uh, to try to get Stoner to retire early. And one way that he tried was to tell Stoner he would throw a party, a retirement party for him. Now, of course, we all know Stoner doesn't care about retirement parties. Um, but for Lomax, this is just one more way to get Stoner to leave the department and the university. Lomax doesn't know at this point that Stoner has cancer uh, and is going to die soon. And so a part of Lomax still thinks that he has convinced Stoner to retire. Um, and so uh, in this circumstance, his retirement party is not 100% cheerful. Uh, not only for Stoner, who's going to die soon, or for Lomax, uh, who, who really hates him, but also for everyone who knows about the feud between Lomax and Stoner. Um, they know that Lomax must be happy to get rid of Stoner. Uh, and so like if they were, if Lomax and Stoner were to talk to each other at the party, it would just be strange. It would feel forced. It would feel uh, inauthentic, not, not genuine, not real feeling. Um, so that's the first half of, that's the first point of this sentence. The second point, after all this time. So we also have a question of time. Sure, at the beginning, uh, Stoner never wanted this to happen with Lomax. Right, remember, even at the very end, when um, Lomax becomes the, the department chair, Stoner is still trying to work with Lomax. It's Lomax who hates Stoner for reasons that we have discussed before about disability and like an inferiority complex, things like that. So, but as time passes, things that have begun earlier start to, to become a habit. Uh, Stoner starts getting used to Lomax's attitude toward him. But both of them, we can say, start getting used to their feud and their uh, non-communication. It's like how, uh, if you remember, uh, when we talked about Stoner's relationship with Edith, one of the questions I asked was, uh, why did the novel call them either old friends or old enemies? And we discussed how old enemies are also a kind of long-lasting relationship. Uh, and so here, that's what we have. It's a relationship of two old enemies. And, you know, this is the last time that Stoner will ever have to see Lomax ever again. It's his retirement party. So, you know, he... The fact that they can maintain this relationship of being old enemies to the very end is one of those things that uh, Stoner can now depend on as part of his life, that can rely on this fact. 
no matter how things change, no matter what happens, he knows that he will always have an enemy in Hollis Lomax. And in some way, that can be comforting, that can be reassuring. Uh, so he's grateful that this, this thing that uh, is a, a thread throughout his long career at the university, from the early days when Lomax was, first became chair, all the way to Stoner's retirement, that this one thing has not changed. It's a steady part of his life. So I think maybe that those are probably the, the two reasons um, why he feels grateful that Lomax still refuses to talk to him. Um, OK, question four. Stoner says of his life, I suppose I didn't want things to be easy. Do you agree? Why or why not? So let's look at this page 270. Uh, okay, no, I, I see Brittany, you're asking a question. Was it really love for Edith if he states blind? So you're talking about his uh, blind, let's see, where is this? To fifty his, uh, let's see. In those first blind foolish days of his courtship and marriage, uh, I think we can say that it's a kind of love. Uh, blind meaning that he he did not know what that love could do in terms of like harm or effect on Edith, but it is still love. Um, I'm I'm I think we can say that even to the end of his life he still loves Edith, but the way that he has. And he is now expressing that love is different because he he finally understands that the way that he had used to express that love was causing harm and pain to Edith. Um, so like we read how um, uh, like later, basically, he just uh, leaves Edith to her own devices, doesn't really uh, try to ask about her life or to try to chat with her, basically letting Edith lead her life as she wants to lead it. Um, that's also a kind of love. It's a kind of love that uh, takes into account what Edith wants from her life and not just the feeling that Stoner has. So yeah, I still think even though it's blind, it's also a kind of love. Um, and like in your, now you're talking about attraction and love. Mm, I think maybe uh, today when we talk about like liking someone versus loving someone, I think that's too evenly divided. Like it's too clean cut. I don't think there's a really clear separation between liking someone and loving someone. Uh, so yeah, uh, Stoner fell in love with Edith because of her beauty and her cultural refinement. Um, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't love her. It, it's also a kind of love. OK, um, so question four on page 270. Uh, let's see, where is this? Ah, OK, so in the middle, this is, uh, I think, Grace's final visit to Stoner. Poor daddy, he heard Grace say. And he brought his attention back to where he was. Poor daddy, things haven't been easy for you, have they? He thought for a moment, and then he said, no, but I suppose I didn't want them to be. Mama and I, we've both been disappointments to you, haven't we? He moved his hand upward as if to touch her. Oh no, he said with a dim passion. You mustn't. He wanted to say more, to explain, but he could not go on. So here it seems like 
things not being easy for him mainly talks about his family relationship. Um, and so if we look back at his relationship with Edith, there was one point where he could have gotten a divorce from her when she says, uh, we both know you won't leave me and Grace. And Stoner agrees. He's not that kind of person. We talked about uh, all the hardship and difficulty that divorce could create for women and single mothers in that time, uh, in that period of history. So Stoner, as a kind person, would rather endure a difficult marriage and a difficult home life and basically being emotionally tortured by Edith rather than uh, make them suffer so that he can have a little peace of mind. So yes, in this relationship, he chooses not to do the easy thing. Um, and then, of course, there's his professional career. Uh, when faced with Charles Walker, who is obviously unfit to be a professor, uh, he could have simply rolled over and said, fine, I don't care. You know, Lomax wants him in. I can't stop him. Uh, but he doesn't. He tries his best to do what he thinks is right. Even though he, uh, I guess he at the time doesn't know that it would be hard. But he could probably tell from the fact that Gordon and like the, the dean and everybody else was willing to let Walker pass his test. Everyone except Stoner. And he did notice that Lomax got really angry with him. So even before Lomax became chair of the department, he probably knew that this was not going to be a good idea uh, for his career. In the sense that a professor has to, if a professor cannot be fired, that means that they can work at that department for as long as they want, which means that for as long as they want, they will have the same coworkers. And so they have to really be able to work with their coworkers. And this is something I'm sure Stoner knows. And yet he still decides to try to stop Walker from passing the test, even if it would hurt these long-term relationships that are very important. Um, and then, of course, Lomax becomes chair, uh, and, and Stoner has to teach freshman composition at the worst possible times of the week. And he does this for years and years and years and years. He doesn't try to get Lomax to change his mind. He doesn't ask his friend Gordon Finch, who's the dean, uh, to help him find a way out. He doesn't move to a different university. He doesn't file a complaint. He doesn't do anything. He just takes it. And not only does he take it, he teaches very, very well. I can tell you from personal experience that composition is not easy to teach. It's very, very uh, exhausting to grade compositions week after week. Um, and yet this is what Stoner does. It's not the easy thing. And I guess we can say that this is out of a, a principle, a sense of principle. Like Lomax is my boss. He decides my courses, uh, and you know, if he decides I have to follow, I'm loyal to the department, I'm loyal to the university, I don't cause trouble. All of these kinds of ideas, I think, are part of what Stoner is thinking. But also another idea, which is that um, suffering for doing what is right. In other words, being a martyr, Lia uh, Su, is also a one way to find meaning in life, to, to work hard for something that you believe in. And Stoner believes in doing the right thing. So if the punishment for trying to stop Walker is this terrible teaching schedule, then he will accept the punishment. He thinks that it's a fair trade for doing something that he should do. So yeah, uh, I agree. He didn't want things to be easy. Not in the practical sense. But there's also another sense of easy, which is uh, to be always consistent and the same. So if you live life according to a strict set of principles, 
and you never waver or change those principles. You never uh, abandon those principles. What that also means is that every time you are faced with a choice, you know exactly what you're going to do because your principle is very clear. So in another sense, this is also an easy way to, to live a life. Compare Stoner with Gordon Finch. From the very beginning, we knew that Gordon Finch is kind of empty headed. He doesn't really have a sense of values. He basically just repeats what the people around him are saying. He tries to make friends. He tries to, uh, to achieve some kind of power and influence. Um, he tries to be a good administrator, which means to not make anyone angry. The only time in the entire novel that Gordon stands up for something is when uh, during Stoner's argument with Lomax about Walker, Lomax threatens to press charges against Stoner to put him on trial in front of the university to try to get him fired. That's the only time in the novel when Gordon Finch stands up and says, no, that is not happening. Uh, but think about how much work Gordon had to put into his career, how he had to please everybody, how he had to take care of so many different things, how much of a headache uh, Stoner and, Wal and uh, Lomax's argument was for him. So leading a life without principles can also be quite hard. Uh, at every moment, you have to figure out for yourself what is the thing to do and how do I do it well? You can't just rely on your core principles and leave everything else uh, to fate. So in that sense, Stoner chooses the easy life. At no point in the entire novel do we see him hesitate, right? There's no one point where he thinks, what if I did the wrong thing? The most that we see is later when he looks back on his early years, he realizes that he had done the wrong thing but it's always too late to change because at every moment he has his principles to count on. Um, so in that sense, uh, he, it is an easy way to live. So it, it depends on how you look at it. It's hard in terms of the fact that he suffers a lot. He has to bear with a lot, but it's easy in terms of he's always clear about what he should do and what he wants to do. I think the key is that there's no such thing as an easy life. Even people who are like really filthy rich, um, who lack for nothing in the world, uh, also have their own troubles and their own struggles. Uh, we may not think that they are that those problems are very big and important problems, but they do. That's the point. The point is not to compare who suffers more. The point is to understand and to have empathy for the different problems that different people have. Right, suffering is not an objective competition. Suffering is a subjective experience uh, that hurts everybody, no matter what the cause is. Um, so, you know, either way that Stoner could have chosen to live his life, there would have been struggles. But he chose to live his life according to his principles. Uh, okay, let's take a short break. Uh, and, uh, you know, this, this video has already been split into two parts, so I guess it doesn't make sense to keep recording during the break. Um, so I'm going to stop recording until we come back. Hang on, let me, how do I? How do I stop recording this? Actually, I think you guys can help me stop recording, right? Oh, no, no, I found it, I found it. Uh, stop 